There will be a second opportunity to ask at the end of the panel because uh, Glenn uh, is uh, staying with us. So, uh, so thank you. And by the way, for uh, other CISOs, for next year's, the, the format of such case study will be more than uh, uh, appreciated and welcome. So you can think about uh, relevant uh, case studies to share with this community uh, for next uh, year. So I, I would like to ask uh, uh, two uh, more uh, uh, participants to join us for the uh, financial uh, panel. The first one is uh, um, Arnaud Bernac, the global head of uh, CIB and All Cell for Cybersecurity and IT Risk, BNP Paribas. Please welcome. <laughs> and I would like to invite Elik Etzion, who is the, uh, the CISO, the uh, the CISO for uh, Bank Apoalim in Israel. Please, Elik, join us. Very important conversation. Uh, I'm the CISO of Apollin Bank, the leading financial institute in uh, Israel. I am the CISO and the head of the IT security department. Uh, we are responsible for leading the cybersecurity corporate program from the strategic level of landscape analysis and so forth, strategy down to the practice. Before I joined the bank, I served for more than 20 years in the Israeli intelligence, but we will leave this part out of the intro. Uh, so I, I would like what I would like to ask um, what what do you think are the main cyber uh, security challenges that financial organizations cope with currently and and uh, will when I will ask directly and, and not uh, um, uh, spending uh, the the three of you for for all the questions so please I don't know if you want to comment to this question yeah so maybe for me there is three parts I wanted to highlight on that the first one is that everyone is uh, for sure in a digital transformation journey. And uh, for that, I think it's changed dramatically the risk profile of the bank of the financial institution. Uh, previously, we were very uh, close and uh, with uh, very low little interactions with the external counterparties of customers. We are opening ourselves to customers, to clients. We are opening our data, so we are changing our risk profile. Second point. Uh, and especially for the corporate activities. So we are facing more and more threats on our payment systems, on how to use and compromise our payment systems uh, to, to generate fraudulent payment. I would say that compared to some uh, GAFA activities we have in the banks and the financial institutions, we have to cope with a huge amount of legacy systems, which for, of, of course it's, uh, some uh, points to take care of. Of is regarding our capacity of execution for plan. More and more the board are aware that security is an important subject. The budget are increasing to a certain level of demand. And uh, how we can secure the execution of those budgets because the market is short of resources. Thank you. Uh, Elik, would you like to comment to this uh, question of the challenges? 
Yeah, I quite agree with, uh, with this interpretation. I think, uh, you know, banks are fundamentally with a very high cyber risk profile because from the attacker, uh, a consequent bank is a hub of money, funds, and a hub of confidential data. So we have uh, basically a very high risk. Now, most of the banks are in some kind of a digital transformation. We are also, uh, except from e-banking, we are also innovating and leveraging technologies like blockchain, AI, so forth. So it's, it's great for business, but it's very challenging uh, for cybersecurity. Our overall security attack surface has expanded. It's expanding all the time, and the risk is expanding with it. So in one sentence, I would say that the main strategic uh, uh, issue for the CISO of financial institution is securing digital transformation without increasing the, the cybersecurity risk. And it's quite challenging. Yeah, so I wanted, Glenn, to ask you uh, specifically about, uh, about the, the transformation and the, the process of transformation that financial organizations uh, have these days. We change the, the infrastructure, the way uh, the organization work and, and other things and how this combined with, with the cyber challenges, uh, you find it uh, um, as, as, a, as a topic. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, uh, similarly to m my colleagues, I, I think it uh, continues to be a huge challenge for us. We're all in digital transformations. Uh, there are benefits, uh, obviously. You know, the, the more we can get away from our legacy infrastructures to greater levels of virtualization, or even you know, into you know, cloud-based services where we're continually updated, can you know, continually patched. I think will be a paradigm changer for us. But you know, that makes us rethink all of our security models and the way we actually protect the enterprise going forward. So it's a two-edged sword, and that with opportunity is also a considerable amount of uh, work because of that transformation. Uh, likewise, we're trying to transform the way that we work, right? So embracing uh, you know, new concepts like agile and uh, becoming uh, you know, more efficient in how we get things done uh, will obviously you know, increase challenges for us in making sure we have the right security around that development and delivery. Uh, but likewise, it creates opportunities for us on the, the cyber portfolio to actually move faster, which we know our adversaries continue to move faster. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that will be an asset for us as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Maybe, maybe to taking the, the last comment and to ask you, Alec, uh, um, in, the last, in the last few years, we, we see kind of uh, on one hand, we are becoming uh, uh, better, but on the other hand, we see involvement of uh, threats and uh, things uh, like uh, this. So do, do you think that we are today more protected or, or the opposite? A tricky question for CISO. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to answer it uh, politically. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we are more exposed. I won't answer if we are more protected. We are more exposed because the financial sector is exposed to cross-sector uh, risks. Like WannaCry last year, you know, who would thought of like a wormish uh, uh, viral virus with an uh, exploit that was uh, taken from the NSA? You, you can't even imagine it. So mal, uh, we've seen here the social uh, stuff and the mobile threats. So, so we are exposed to all this cross-sector sect, but we are also exposed to our specific uh, sector threats. And from my point of view, the most disturbing trend is the targeted attacks that APT groups, uh, like cybercrime groups and the nation state-sponsored groups, which are targeting the core banking systems, SWIFT systems, Taiwan, Bangladesh, the ATM management systems, and this is like a whole new ball game. And this is a specific threat because, what I said before, we are the hub of money and the hub of confidential data. So we are more exposed. Mm -hmm. Would you like Arnaud to comment to the, this question? Uh, yes, with pleasure. For, for sure, I think we are better protected. Uh, and I know that when I am saying this sentence probably at that time I could be compromised <laughs> so so with all the respect I have so, now we increase uh, we are we have all uh, security program to increase our posture so definitely for sure we are better protected it's a race and it's a it's a balance between the, the exposure which is we were discussing at the beginning of the of the panel regarding the speed of the evolution definitely the speed of the evolution uh, we could not uh, drive uh, acceleration program at the same speed 
than the spread are, are touching us. That when you mentioned WannaCry, uh, one year ago it was uh, NotPetya which was uh, touching certain uh, companies. Uh, even if the technology uh, with NotPetya was not new, what was new is the fact that those attacks have been designed to destroy the entire IT system. Three, uh, three or six months ago it was more public that we do not have to take care only at the soft software level regarding vulnerabilities, we have to take care now also at the hardware level about the vulnerabilities. So uh, you can imagine that the surface of attack uh, regarding artificial intelligence, we are at the very beginning of implementing artificial intelligence. When we talk about how uh, hackers ca can use uh, malicious techniques to manipulate either the data or the output of artificial intelligence, but they are more advanced and, and we have not yet started to implement it uh, rightly. So it's a race um, and, and we could not uh, run at the same speed than the, the threats. So, um, but we need to continue to run <laughs> and accelerate. Okay. Um, I, will, I will let know the, the industries that are waiting outside uh, with the last comment. They will be happy to, you know. Um, you have implemented necessary security measures uh, to your company's data. However, one of your suppliers was attacked. Given this situation, how do you protect your organization from threats of third-party attacks? Would you like uh, Glenn to start to comment for this? Sure. Yeah, h happy to. And you know, the, this is not even hypothetical, right? I think we, we've all probably been uh, cross-impacted by several uh, you know t uh, breaches that are out there. Yeah. You know, uh, I think. It's very much an exercise in a knowing who your major suppliers are and making sure you have some level of assurance what their security is. You know, we've got a fairly significant investment in a third-party cyber risk program that goes out and makes those assessments, but that only gives you a point-in-time view, right? And uh, you know, you have to be prepared, you know, with your other partners within the organization between legal, compliance, operational risk, if you have those functions, and how you would respond. And uh, I would say within the last year, you know, there was a pretty significant uh, breach that impacted most uh, financial services organizations. I think uh, we all responded uh, very well in uh, gathering as an industry to both address this uh, common systemic provider, understanding how we would identify customers that may, may be impacted, how we would respond to the situation collectively because it impacts us all. And then, you know, we all managed through, you know, our fraud processes and communications in various ways. But uh, I think the number one thing that we've learned through that experience is you've got to go through scenario analysis and, you know, and plan for these types of events because they will, it's no longer a one in 50 year event anymore. Mm -hmm. This is a one in 10 year, one in five year type of event. So uh, if you want to, you know, protect your brand and protect your customers, you know, you have to have a pretty good playbook of how you're going to respond. Right. Thank you. Um, you know, we cannot uh, ask a few questions with not uh, mentioning uh, blockchain. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, uh, you know, um, my reputation as moderator. Uh, so, uh, so about <laughs> blockchain, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a buzz uh, this time, but I would like to get your, uh, your uh, views. If you think that blockchain technologies will solve cybersecurity challenges in the following years or only in the uh, far future? Elik, would you like to comment? Started blockchain is uh, quite a buzz. Uh, it's, it's a really amazing and disrupting uh, technology, but I would say it's in the peak of uh, its uh, inflated expectations. Expectations. We we see a lot of research, a lot of investments with VCs and startups with blockchain. We see much less production ecosystems based on blockchain. So this is not for our panel, it's for another panel. But from the security perspective. Uh, I would analyze it uh, using the CIA model, as we all know, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability model. So if you look at the basics of blockchain, it's a very uh, highly high available uh, platform. Uh, because of, of the distributed ledger, you take one of the nodes down, you have the other uh, uh, tracks in the other uh, uh, nodes, and, it's, and it's, it's not so confidential, but the, it's very it's very high integrity because of the uh, the cryptographic and the sequ sequential <coughs> hashing and we won't go we won't drive into it so it's quite immutable but blockchain was born as a public network but the business cases that use blockchain 
especially in banks, is private blockchain or community blockchain, like a coalition of parties with mutual interest building a, a community blockchain. And in that way, you have to protect the blockchain with the authentication authorization mechanism because it's not confidential. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think blockchain will solve the problems for CISOs. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything with IoT, endpoint security, zero days attacks, but I would love to see uh, business cases implemented on blockchain and gaining mm -hmm. uh, the positive gains that I uh, mentioned. Great. Would you like, Glenn, to comment about the blockchain question? Sure, sure. And, and I think similarly, I think there's a lot of heightened expectations on it. I think everyone's uh, been fairly aggressive out of the gate to see what the opportunity is. And I think, um, although, you know, the future looks bright, uh, potentially for like big data and, you know, keeping uh, information uh, confidential at some point, uh, the, also the transaction capability isn't there, right? So if you're interested in payments or anything where you need millisecond response time, you're not going to get that currently out of blockchain. So uh, I would agree with everything uh, you know my partner up here said, but uh, I would say the opportunities uh, realistically are several years uh, down the road. I would like to ask if you had to choose between a better implementation of methodologies, education, and internal processes on one hand, or technological innovation, which would you prefer? And furthermore, can you share your idea on how to balance uh, the two sides for better protection of financial institution? Would you like or not to comment? Ah, a great question. <laughs> uh, I, I used to say that uh, cybersecurity is a too serious subject to leave it alone to security experts. So <laughs> definitely it should not be only on the, on the IT or the security side. Uh, I don't know what are the right balance. I don't know if it's 50-50 or, uh, or not, but I do believe that, uh, and it has been also mentioned, uh, that education uh, is probably something uh, on which we need to continue to pay attention. I am always fascinating by seeing how people can behave in the digital world in a different way than they behave in the physical world. So. I think we definitely there is still something to do about education. Uh, we used to talk about security by design, or, but we are not yet at this subject. So, uh, if we want to design a new application uh, by new, new software, the security should be uh, at the very beginning of the conception, and it's not yet the case. So. Um, it's the role of the security expert to continue to, uh, to, to, to drive the transformation into the business and to drive the transformation into the other IT discipline in order to let them understood that it's not only a technical and expertise subject, not only, but it's how the company is driving this risk which is now becoming an operational risk. And so, um, so the right balance is 55-45, and I don't know who is 55. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Elik, please. I would like uh, to comment, you know, I don't think we have the privilege to choose. Like a very innovative uh, technology wouldn't compensate for a poor patch management uh, process. So the way we, we do it, and based on my experience, we, we use like a maturity assessment uh, tools based, uh, you know, on a public a comprehensive uh, cybersecurity framework like the NIST or the FFIC or choose any framework you, you, you like. And then you get like this map of maturity for your technology, your processes and your people. And then we focus on like strengthening our weakest uh, muscles. Uh, I think this is the best practical way. If you have to choose because of a strict budget, I would choose protecting your critical assets, your crown jewels, and not trying to protect everything, because protecting everything is it's economically impractical. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Would you like, uh, Glenn, to comment about this? Uh, yeah, I think the only thing I, I would add on top of what was already discussed is that, you know the, the push for cyber literacy in the businesses, I think, has other advantages in prioritization. We, we all said it, it, it behooves us to move faster in deploying you know, and, and keeping up in what was uh, referred to as the arms race. I think this is exactly right. 
my own experience as we've tried to get the business more involved in the conversation is, although potentially painful up, for, up front, uh, I think it starts to become very real to them. And then when those trade-off decisions come on where investment is going to be applied, I think there's probably more priority that can be had. And likewise, uh, back to you know securing new assets. I mean, uh, maybe a show of hands, how many CISOs here have had uh, their businesses want to do something really innovative, but they forgot to tell you about it until they were probably three quarters of the way through the project, <laughs> right? That's virtually every hand in the room, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I think the more real it, it becomes to the business, they start to realize that security is something they need to take seriously and to make sure that they have our groups at the table up front, which I think is where we'd all like to be. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to ask uh, the last question that uh, I know you, you have touched it in a way that cyber security is more more and more a broad discussion. In that sense, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, this change, how it influence the strategy, the management, the reporting, and the execution. So maybe you would like to be the first to comment uh, and later. Yeah, uh, I would say the, the good news is that now cybersecurity is a broad discussion in, I think, most of our organization. So the second good news is that we have to learn on how to talk to the board on that subject. And uh, regarding bank and financial institution, if I, if I really uh, sum up in one sentence, a bank is a risk factory, in fact. So uh, uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we manage uh, credit risk, we manage market risk, we manage operational risk. Cybersecurity is one of the disciplines of the operational risk. So the main, the main concern is how to turn uh, this subject, which is very technical by design, uh, into a risk posture and how you can integrate it into the risk management framework <coughs> of the bank. And so I don't have uh, the answers, all the answers, but w the main difficulties I saw is that first, this is a very new discipline. So we don't have so much historical data in order to build a uh, model or to build uh, uh, some referential. And we mentioned it. The, the, the nature of the threat is evolving at a considerable speed and the, what is very specific to this subject to turn it into a, a, a risk, a personal risk posture is how you identify your risk, how, how you quantify your risk and how you try to measure it and to, to put uh, financial figures into it. After that, how you build a board dashboard if I say so, <laughs> uh, because uh, your CEO doesn't care about the deployment of the antivirus, but you need, uh, even if you have to t to measure that, but you you, you have to uh, to create and to to design new uh, new figures in order to uh, to to have your, your board inside your. Uh, your plan and your strategy, and in fact, you have to identify, you mentioned framework, when you are operating globally, we are lacking of standardization regarding cybersecurity, so uh, how to have a common framework which can work all over the world in order to give a, a precise baseline to your customer, to the different regulators, it's, we are not yet there. Thank you. So I, I would like to give uh, our audience uh, the opportunity to, to ask or to comment. <coughs> Since there are sitting here uh, many CISOs, so if in case someone wants to, to comment, it's also uh, okay. So we'll take two uh, questions or uh, comments for the, uh, from the audience, please. Uh, my name is Itzik and I'm a uh, former of uh, CISO in the health industry and before I served 30 years in the Air Force. And uh, the question is, it's not a question yet, but will be a question. We have a very good technological solution for every attack that there is in the world, you know. And the, the, we have a very good doctrine about uh, cybersecurity. And we have a very good intelligence and we can find every anomaly in the net, in the cyber. It's happened. So what is the reason that there is a tact? Every day there is a tact, every day kind of a tact. And the question is, maybe the security officer are ranked at the low managerial position 
And in many cases, waiting in the IT department, and therefore, their voice is not heard by the top management and the board of director in your company. Maybe it will, if it will change, the position of the attacks will be better. What do you think about it? I'll, I'll go first. You know, I, like we just discussed, you know, with the, the, the board, uh, uh, with the board visibility and the visibility with the executive leadership anymore, I don't think we're the technology guys in the basement anymore, right? Sliding pizzas under the door. Um, I, I think we get the, the priority that we need. I think when you talk about the, the tools that are available and why do we have these issues, of course, there's still zero days, right? But the most common breaches don't come from those. It's the legacy infrastructures that we talked about. It's the struggles that most large enterprises have with fundamental things like uh, inventory management, patch management. You know, I think everyone's collectively getting better. I think, you know, there, there's a, but there's a lot of legacy work that you have to get through before we all can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, solve that problem. I don't think it's an easy problem to solve. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, in my position, I do not think uh, I, I have an issue regarding my positioning. Uh, but uh, we are not only facing a zero day attack, we are facing also a very common attack. And as you rightly mentioned, how in a large organization with a huge amount of legacy can you ensure that you have a proper asset management which is up to date, that you have a full view uh, regarding all your assets, how you can ensure that when you are combining a, a various set of techno technology, you can rightly patch them uh, at the right speed. Uh, it's, it's one of the issues, and it's not a managerial issue. Uh, for sure, if, you are, if the security uh, function is well positioned, uh, you have uh, the right leadership and the right support of the business <coughs> to uh, cut systems for, from time to time to update uh, and to apply patches, for example. Uh, for sure, if you are in a lower part of the organization, it will be uh, much harder. But um, it's not only a question of technology. I would say one sentence. I, I think cybersecurity, we are in a battlefield. So your question is like to ask why do we have wars? Uh, if Microsoft has vulnerabilities and Google has vulnerabilities, so we are implementing all these sorts of technologies, we'll always be vulnerable, and there is like a learning context, contest between the attacker and the defender, and there will always be attacks. It's not a matter of position or budget. My colleague here said we have enough budget. Uh, it's a matter of the learning context. Who wins the learning context, the attackers or the defenders? And it's like, you know, a round process, it will go forever. I think that the, with these uh, words that they describe the, the, the arm race and the, the learning uh, race will uh, will uh, conclude this uh, uh, this panel. I want to thank you so much. It was really uh, very educational and interesting. And to thank you, and we continue. Thank you very much.